Hello and welcome to our first Happiness webinar, Our House is Designed to be Lived in 24-7. My name is Holly Kaneen and I'm the editor of Habitus and Habitus Living. I'm joined by our lovely panellists, Rob Mills, Michelle Ozaki, Brent Callow and Shannon Peach, who I will properly introduce in just a moment. Today we are speaking about what we are learning as architects, designers, developers, product suppliers, and more generally as residents, as we spend more time than ever in our home. I'm looking forward to delving into ideas about how our homes can be designed as spaces in which we want to spend the majority of our weekends, spaces to better facilitate our hobbies and interests, and spaces that when the need arises can offer us comfortable and productive environments in which to work. We'll also be looking at evolutions in residential architecture over the past decade uh, in design and function, uh, as well as predicting how a global health crisis might impact or encourage further growth in the months, years and even decades to come. If you have any questions that come to mind throughout the discussion, please pop them in the dedicated Q&A uh, channel just below um, and we will come to them in the final 10 minutes of this 60 minute webinar. I'll now introduce our panellists, who they are, what they do, their history in the architecture and design industry and the insights they'll be able to share with us today and then we can get started. First up, we've got Rob Mills. Rob is the founder and creative director of his eponymous uh, design practice, Rob Mills Architecture and Interiors. He is an award-winning Australian architect specialising in commercial and luxury residential architecture and design and interior design. Under the architectural arm of his studio, he works across contemporary new builds, heritage restorations and extensions, and the design of entire com apartment complexes, such as Hampton by RMA. We've got Michelle Ozaki, who is the co-founder, co-director, and one half of the Sydney-based architecture duo, Clayton Ozaki, which was founded in 2015. Prior to this, she worked for Alex Popov and Associates for 10 years, and it was here that she met her future business partner, Rebecca Clayton. Together, they are interested in modern design in urban, rural, coastal, and interstate settings. Their first, their first project, Barn House, won the Contemporary Design Award at the 2016 Waverley Design and Heritage Awards and exemplifies the studio's commitment to working closely with client and site to craft unique and place-specific design for their projects. Shannon Peach, we've also got joining us today. Uh, Shannon is one of three directors at Milio Property, a property development company with a focus on building thoughtfully designed spaces, both inside and out, uh, that contribute to the landscape and architectural surroundings in which they build. Shannon has 15 years of experience managing medium and high density residential and mixed use projects across Australia and a passion for socially and environmentally conscious occupier focused design. This year, Milio is celebrating 10 years and 25 projects to date. Finally, we've got Brent Callow. Brent is the manager of strategic accounts for Havelitz, Australia. Established in 1975 in Britain, Have Woods quickly became Britain's foremost timber flooring company, supplying architects and design hunters across the world. Working on projects across a range of disciplines from residential, commercial, high volume retail and hospitality, Brent and Have Woods are dedicated to ensuring their clients are specifying engineered timber flooring that is fit for purpose and suitable for the needs and use of the space. Welcome to our panel. As if we were in person, it would all give you a round of applause. Um, but we're not, so we'll have to accept a virtual one. Thanks, Holly. <laughs> Thanks, Holly. All right. Let's get started. I, I'm excited to get into this. I think it's quite an interesting topic. And, and from speaking previously, we've had quite uh, in, a few interesting points brought up. To begin with, in the past couple of weeks, what have we noticed about spending the majority of our time at home? Shannon, you're working from, from a room in your house that you previously wouldn't have spent a whole lot of time in. Is that right? Yes, thanks, Holly. Um, yeah, we, we um, moved to remote working um, our office, um, I think, late in February, early in March. And it was, um, I guess, an experience that we were sort of dragged into um, rather than had anything pre-prepared with sort of focused our, our business, I guess, on 
mostly being um, sort of face-to-face -face interactions and, and um, fostering relationships that way. Um, so we hadn't, I guess, moved our business as quickly to, to digital and on, online working as um, some other people. So yes, we, we commenced working um, about 10 or 11 weeks ago from home and um, I'm, yeah, working from a, a dining room that I think in the previous 12 months of living here um, probably had maybe three, three or four um, meals at. Um, otherwise, it was just sort of that extra room, but it's um, turned into the absolute perfect home office for us. Yeah. And Michelle, you've always worked from home. So where is your workspace located in the house and, and how is it set up? Well, our house is an old 1950s house and it's split level and my work area is the lowest level of the house connected to the garden. It's open plan. It's connected to the rest of the house. But we have a huge slab of joinery in the room and in that slab of joinery are several plug-in workstations, um, a television and even a piano. So the room is multi-use. It's flexible for me during the day to work in and for my family to enjoy at night when I don't want to be working. <laughs> And, and you sort of mentioned previously when we spoke that it was almost, you know, at the end of the house. So is it, um, in terms of its location in, in layout, you don't get too much um, walkthrough or distraction? Not at all. It's the full stop of the house. It connects to the garden. It's the lowest level. So, no, it's, it's actually a beautiful space. And I think one thing we've learned during this time is that we don't want to be locked in cupboards in, with our computer. We actually want some sense of prospect in our workspaces and some sense of connection to the environment outside. And this room certainly has that. Do you think offices will potentially pick that up moving forward? I think so. I think when people are picking up their laptops to relocate to a garden table, I think they're realising that workspaces, like all good spaces, need a sense of retreat and need a sense of prospect. So in other words, they need a sense of privacy and certainly be suitable for digital um, environments like this, but they also need some connection to the greater environment to make the workspace a nice place to be, an inspirational place to be. Mm -hmm. Rob and Brent, I know you guys have um, been working in and out of the office because you've been able to. So I'll jump to the next question. Um, what are some of the subtle evolutions that we've seen in the design of homes, both apartments and single dwellings in the past 10 years? Uh, Rob, you mentioned previously uh, two ends of the spectrum, one being clients wanting more clearly defined spaces and the other being clients who are after open plan living and then the need as architects to incorporate maybe acoustic barriers and visual separation. I think we all desire space and it is the great luxury. Um, but what we're uh, aware of, especially now, is that living together, we do need acoustic and visual separation to conduct our meetings and telephone calls and things like that. So. I'm, no, I'm also noticing a trend back to individual rooms away from open plan. For me, I think the, the, the somewhere in between is, is the right outcome. There might be one designated room within a, 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 a residence, be it a, an apartment building or a house where everyone can escape and, and, um, and um, make their calls and, and, and achieve their privacy and quiet space quiet environment um, and that that's important and then i think together as a family we need a little bit of space to gather so um, there's more demand for a more traditional floor plan which is separate rooms i'm seeing it but i think you know as the pendulum swings it'll settle somewhere in between where we want i mean we want everything don't we Everybody wants everything. So, I definitely subscribe to that, Rob. We we uh, made the choice to have three generations living under our roof um, before all of this happened. So, we it, it's definitely been um, a different consideration having um, a mother-in-law and an eight-month-old within the one space, and and that's led us um, for me to politely say to experience our home differently. Yeah, I think um, 
It's interesting taking it away from the working at home, but even the weekends that we're spending inside our houses, how, you know, how has that kind of, I guess, shown us what we want out of a house, what we want out of the places that we live in? Um, I think it's that constant sort of, uh, like what Rob said, the pendulum swinging between the sort of the open plan, summary space connected to the garden and the idea that there are rooms which are more wintry and more cosy and more enclosed. So I think that's part of what we've been seeing in design briefs as we've been in the last few years is there are certain rooms in the house assigned to this notion of engaging with the outside environment both socially and and naturally and then there are spaces which are designed for retreat and refuge and i think that they don't necessarily be need to be assigned a program they can actually be assigned a quality so those spaces can be flexible and functional and you can go into the cozy space for a multitude of tasks and vice versa mm. Bren, in your, in your experience, sort of less designing spaces, but maybe fitting out spaces that people have, you know, already, already got, how, what have you noticed in the past kind of years of, of what people look for and how people live? Yeah, I suppose um, in, in the, you know, the Australian way of living, which is, uh, you know, might stay brought up on the, on the quarter acre block and uh, a, uh, a, a nice big backyard uh, with the densification of our suburbs that has uh, and a bit of a quantum shift to uh, you know alternative ways of uh, of you know providing living and, and dare I say it in this current world of ours working um, in those places uh, you know definitely Rob from what he says is that you know open plan living has has been a um, has been a shift to you know connected kitchen lounge room living room dining rooms big open space uh, got the opportunity to showcase some you know lots of views if the if the if the uh, property is is uh, you know has that has those uh, features and, and you know inclines to, to be able to do that. But I think um, in having a bit you know visited um, some some clients some um, homes and even some of our own own timber floors that have been installed in you know the people that have bought apartments and so on and seeing them really struggle to to work in in that environment. You know seeing someone trying to set up a you know a computer and a laptop and a little sort of rebate of a wall inside a two bedroom apartment um you know showcases the ability for us to you might say try and do something better as as, as we've said you know somewhere in the middle not not to um you know cubicalize a um a, a, a house but also not to have it to open plan so i think there's a there's a there's a slightly different mix out there that we can uh, can be aiming at I'd also like to say that um, the drive towards open planning has also brought about the realisation that our service spaces need to be more carefully designed so that we may tuck things away. For example, the pantries become the butler pantry, which now has appliances inside it so that there's more separation between our open plan areas and our service areas. And entries have mud rooms, which are taken from the idea ideas of country houses where boots and jackets may be stored and bags may be stored, particularly apt during our current COVID, um, you know, urge to be clean in the house and wanting to basically shed the, the, the outside sort of um, before you come inside. Yeah, potentially even more ritualistic of, of leaving, like entering, entering the home, which is more personal. Yeah, and, you know, like Japanese architecture where the bathtub's at the door and people must remove their shoes and have the bath in traditional Japanese houses before they enter the space. Mm. It's, certainly a time, it's a, certainly a time of change, isn't it? And so I liked um, your idea then, Michelle, of bringing in alternative cultures and considering them for our, the, our way of life. And, and this is one of the great joys of this time in amongst all of the of the um, trauma is it's a time of change and that's one of the things that we can embrace. That's the positive we can embrace from this time. Definitely. Um, Shannon, you design it at Melio Property, kind of, you know, houses for a lot of people. How do you think this will make you, um, or what do you think you'll take from this designing for a lot of people moving into the future how can we be both specific to individual needs but then also i guess a little bit more mass um mass oriented yeah sure um 
I guess we've always um, taken the pathway of um, designing the apartments fr from the inside out, really taking the view of um, the occupant and, and putting those glasses on rather than starting with the outside of a building and, and sort of just cutting it up. So um, it, it really instills, I think, the, uh, the importance of um, room and apartment planning driving the overall building design. Um, we found that um, people have been using um, their apartments in, in different ways, especially when they're having to combine a workplace um, with, with a residence, but um, incorporating things that we, we always have, like having um, flexible second bedrooms that open up from, from living spaces that can be utilised, but also um, ensuring that, uh, I guess, that there's a, a sense of community throughout the, the whole building and that there's um, amenity close by so that people feel as though they're not restricted um, to just living within their particular apartment or their, their four walls, but that there is, um, I guess, added amenity um, within a, a short distance without having to necessarily cross town. Mm. And Rob, you kind of design between the two as well, apartments and single residences. What are, what's, um, what, what are the differences and, and kind of, I guess, subtleties that you can see? Uh, the great difference is space. Um, I think we all aspire to have the same things, um, but for, for, for different reasons, we can't all attain them. So traditionally an apartment is um, a, a miniature version of a house and um, has all the same qualities and expectations and, and um, hopefully ways of life that make it a truly great living experience, um, but just on a, on a smaller scale. So, Michelle pointed out earlier that there's a real importance to carefully design all of the areas within our apartments and houses. And I think she's right. Um, if we can do that, uh, the quality of life within uh, will be improved. And that's the role of a residence is to, it's a place to live. And if we as designers and, and facilitators and providers of product and so on can improve um, enhance the way people live, I think we've done our job. Mm. What do you think this time has shown us about how we like to spend our time at home? You know, whether whether it's working from home, but also you know, leisure activities, what are our hobbies? Do we like to cook at home? Like, you know, what do we, what do our home spaces need to provide from that? We mentioned, you know, um, connection to the outdoors previously also. I think um, at this time we've needed each other more than more than normal. Mm. We needed to embrace each other and the reassurance of being together and sharing our lives together and knowing that we can rely on each other because we're, we're all on edge at the moment and we're all feeling a little bit fragile and vulnerable. And so I think home has been a place where we, our loved ones can gather and, and support each other. Um, as we move um, beyond uh, the first few weeks, we, we're, you know, searching for our independence again and things like that. But uh, for me, that's been the big change. It's, um, my phone doing it, so it's, um, home has been a place to gather. love to open that to the rest of the panel, that idea of, of what is this time at home uh, shown us about how we like to spend our time. In a real practical sense, I've, I've found, like I was saying before, experiencing um, home differently. I've, I've found different aspects of my house have, have become far, gained more importance, I guess, like the Robbers and Michelle were saying that like the kitchen um, is really become very important because we've just been spending more time together um, cooking um, having separate spaces for for people to to read or to watch tv 
um, not always together because uh, like most um, working people, we spent most of our time during the day out of the home and, and now we're spending all of the time in the home. So those, those private spaces and separate spaces, but also um, kitchen and connection to their outdoor space. A couple of points I'd like to make is, make is our homes have become more than our homes now. They're our offices, our gymnasiums. Um, and basically, it's, it's the spaces we need now are broader than what they have been if the home is just our bolt hole. So I think, you know, in that way, it can teach us how spaces can be designed more flexibly um, so that spaces are adaptable to different uses and that you don't necessarily need to have a room for each program, but actually one room can have many programs. Um, and um, yeah, so I think there's that. And yeah, I think that's one of the main things. Yeah, I definitely think that idea of flexible spaces is uh, both productive, but also, um, you know, a little bit, maybe something that you don't realise or you don't think of until it's kind of put in front of you. How do you think, um, what are the different kind of spaces that we could use to be flexible? So you can have studies and spare rooms, like what are the, what rooms can double up with each other? Well, it comes back to that notion that I raised before where by if we design our service spaces well and we have good storage and good capacity to plug things in and plug things out of our main spaces, then we can live with this beautiful, harmonious, open planned area free from clutter and things can be put away and brought out as required. And I think it's about um, that combination of well-designed service and ancillary spaces plugging into beautifully designed open spaces with a greater prospect of the environment. Yeah, I'd also like to add is that the, the enforced um, decentralisation of work um, through this current period has really shone a spotlight on, on homes. You know, where does, you know, where does a person do their work? Um, how can they do it efficiently? Um, you know, just for, for, for my own personal example, um, you know, needing a needing a uh, a room that is, <clears throat> you know, acoustically um, good for to uh, for doing you know phone calls or for doing webinars without it being you know being disrupted or or being uh, uh, you know uh, impractical. So you know, there's there's got to be a, I think there's got to be a uh, a separation in regards to the way we go about you know the design of of homes and how we work from them, but make sure there's not too much disconnection. Uh, it's it's an interesting term that we've always used, the home office. Um, maybe it's the office home, who knows? Yeah, our spaces should be pleasant and inspirational and nice to live in. So for that, we still need this, this concept of, of prospect. And in many ways, I drew this example the other day when we spoke, but in many ways, what we're going through currently with COVID um, can draw some similarities to what happened in the early 20th century with tuberculosis and how modernism changed design from 19th century sets of rooms to spaces which had an emphasis on natural light, lots of air and lots of space. In fact, Le Corbusier actually had devised a formula for the minimum amount of windows for a healthy house and had placed it hand washing sink at the front door of his famous Villa Savoy. So there was a movement that was you know, happening in that early 20th century through the fear of tuberculosis, which may draw some parallels to what we're currently going through. But the lesson, the take home from that is that we need spaces that do have light, air and space that we can inhabit and not feel trapped in. Can I, can I add to that, Holly? Please, yeah. Yeah. It's a good segue, Michelle, a good foundation comment. Um, we have a responsibility as practitioners, all of us, and suppliers to create and design um, environments that are healthy to live in so there are no toxins and so on in our specification. And, um, and that is a kind of relatively new movement. It's been talked about for a long time, but it's been difficult to achieve because the suppliers... Um, weren't supplying those sorts of products and that they are today. Europe, I think, led the way. Is that correct, Brett? Would you summarise the Europeans as the forefront and then it's um, it's filtered out through the world from Europe or would you say it's the Americans or...? 
Well, I, I'd definitely go so far to say it's definitely Northern Hemisphere, um, but yeah. I want to uh, polarise um, any any nationalities out there. But yeah, definitely from a from a certification and standards point of view, Europe has really led the way. You have what's has been you know, originated in that um, part of the world has really adopted that and. It's part of our part of our corporate DNA to supply healthy materials for healthy buildings. It's scientifically proven and and practiced now throughout the the, you know, the modern world, where healthy materials lead to more healthier outcomes um, for people's lives in those buildings. So Probably have, less, uh, less obvious experience of the the home that you're immediately. Uh, I guess you can experience the the light quality or the the thermal quality of your home at various times, but it's, you need to spend prolonged periods of time there to really get a feeling for, for the health properties um, of, of the home. I the just like to extend that point that Rob has raised to, to talk about EMR in the home. And yet we're all becoming increasingly digitally focused with Wi-Fi's and 5G and all sorts of um, electronic devices in our homes. And I, I have recently had clients that have been quite concerned about EMR in the home and they have requested specific electrical designs in their homes so that Wi-Fi may be um, you know, turned off easily in certain periods and there are no dimmers and there are, no, you know, the awareness of the electromagnetic radiation in the home um, is raised and dealt with rather than ignored. Even the concept of, of um, heating and cooling, you sort of mentioned that briefly, Shannon, but I think, um, you know, into the future, how will we design our houses to be a little bit, will, be, will we be more aware of um, the importance that throughout the day they need to be uh, fairly efficient in those ways? You know, we haven't been spending our days at home because we go to a, a um, temperature controlled office, but now as we're spending time at home and we notice that it's going into winter and we're colder and, it, you know, maybe the, the warmth isn't retained or the first couple of weeks it was quite warm, certainly in Sydney. So, you know, how will that inform uh, even, even the briefs? You know, I think it's something that uh, architects and designers and developers and kind of our industry is fairly on top of, but how will um, this inform what clients are briefing in and asking for? Yeah, absolutely. Light, light quality, um, air quality, acoustic quality, thermal comfort. Um, I certainly think that spending more time in the home will place a, a greater value um, for people on those things. They'll, they'll see um, and be willing to, to invest further uh, in those things that once could have been um, yeah, le less important or um, less willing to, to invest in, in long term. And it's inexpensive. Insulation is um, really one of the most inexpensive elements within a building. And um, all we have to do is leave room for insulation because you need volume, um, airspace, and then specify the insulation. And um, there you have it. And you've got a thermally secure environment, which are much more enjoyable to live in. So um, often it's um, client-led, isn't it? The industry is sometimes a bit slow to, to, uh, to embrace these um, ideas and it's the clients who lead us to, um, to specifying these solutions. Absolutely. Education, education we've always found to be the key that the more we as, as a, a developer or a designer can educate people en masse, the more that they'll be coming to you with the brief saying, I've, I've learned about thermal comfort or, or acoustic performance and, and this now forms part of my brief for, for my new design. How do we think briefs, will, briefs for the home will change after this, especially coming from clients? What, what do you think um, you know, residents and occupants will be asking for and seeking out? I think it's like a Formula One race with a lot of clients. They're quite proud. Um, they want to be inventive and um, they want to lead their friends and their family with solutions that haven't been considered before. And so they'll go in, in search of ideas around the world and introduce them to you, their designer. And um, so I, and that's, that's, the, um, that's the power of the internet. It's really changed design. 
through Pinterest and Instagram and, and the other visual mediums, um, people are now really educated. And you can see the quality of design because I've been at this for 30 years. So I've watched the quality of Australian design just improve out of sight to the point where it's really quite challenging as a designer to design something that's unique and of the equal of your peers because all of a sudden your peers are actually quite good at what they do. Whereas, you know, back 30 years ago, there weren't many who were being creative and inventive and so on. So it's, it's a powerful time. It's a great time to be um, a client, a consumer, I think. There's lots of good choice. Michelle, you're nodding along. How do you think um, yeah, it's change it's coming from the client? It's a deviation from our original topic, but I often reflect on how social media has um, educated and changed our clients because um, I've also been working for some long time in design. And <laughs> um, basically what I'm seeing is that clients are more educated. They're more visually educated. But what's happening is because there's a feast of... Uh, things to look at on social media they're less inclined to come to key decisions quickly because there's always the next thing it's like I like that but I also like this <laughs> so in, in many senses that's now our role as, as designers is to actually filter the influences that come visually upon our clients and help them to keep a key path in what they're trying to create so there's not like a, a million you know of of influences on the one project. So, yeah, it's it's definitely changed our landscape as designers. Hmm. Shannon, you count some of Melbourne's most celebrated architecture and design studios in your list of collaborators. As a developer, what have you uh, learned working with out-of-house architects? Um, I think... We, we work with um, new and emerging practices, but also um, quite established practices um, as well. And, and one thing that um, is sort of not negotiable before we um, start on a new, new relationship is, is making sure that we share the principle of, of designing something that fits within its um, place or its surroundings and, and context. Um, so it's probably we learn something new off, off each um, designer because they're usually from the area that we're designing in and they design colloquially with a, a, a colloquial um, kind of design palette. Um, but we're, we're always learning something new, how to design, um, seeing the, the cat in the back of the show. <laughs> um, something new about how, how to design um, certain aspects of, of a building better. It's been interesting for us, I think, in this period to see how um, that there's probably been a shortcoming when it comes to um, multi-res and, and a certainly high-rise um, multi-residential that um, was really focused on, I guess, being that sort of hotel style of of accommodation where where people really just had their things and went to sleep but um probably spent most of their waking hours um elsewhere whereas i think that the there'll be a, a much more of a push towards um multi-residential that really caters for people in a more rounded sense like we're talking about today that people can live 24 four seven. Hmm. You're at Milio, you're quite particular with the sites that you choose to build on and the community and amenity that surrounds. Maybe you sort of mentioned that just now, maybe you talk us through what you're looking for and, and why that's so important to you. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess w we look to, um, we looked for, for density. We don't, we don't shy away from, um, densifying, um, our city and, and inner suburbs where um, amenity um, already exists that we, we can grow upon. So we're really about, um, yeah, designing for that sort of 20 minute neighborhood um, where there's a diverse existing neighborhood of, of people um, and introducing a diverse range of, of dwelling sizes 
to suit all all kinds of people from young professionals to to downsizers to but there's there's so many subgroups um, that we find in between that of uh, one of our biggest emerging um, markets is really designing for solo downsizers um, single single person dwellings is um, I think that the largest category um, of emerging housing in Australia that needs to be catered for and, and we find that people often think of a downsizer um, as a as a, a cashed up um, well financed um, couple who have probably sold a large home but in reality what we find is that there's there's a lot of um, single older people um, who really are craving um, a sense of community, a sense of security um, and being closer to people um, rather than further away and, and probably hopefully closer to family as well. Michelle, site-specific um, is, is something that's quite important to your practice as well and, and mentioned a lot in the, in the project briefs of the works that you do. How do you, um, I guess, kind of uh, respond to it and research it and, and get a better understanding for the places that you build? Um, <clears throat> well, we generally um, are designing homes for families. Um, we are, our work is primarily single residences. Um, so, and every site is unique. And some of our homes are, I mean, I had to do a house recently in Cottesloe Beach in Perth, which was challenging and we did it remotely. But a lot of it's just understanding, firstly, what the client wants to get out of their site. We do spend a lot of time discussing what the client's objectives are for their site to understand what they like about it, what they don't like about it. Um, and then of course, looking at how the sun moves around the site, where the winds come, what we, how we can get the most out of this particular site for each home so that the, the internal environment is as good as it can be with passive thermal methods of design. So there's that as well. Can I add to that, Holly? Yeah. Um, land is the driver. Land, edge, uh, land informs us as to what the solution should be on that land. If you go to um, a property, a parcel of land with a preconceived idea and you're not flexible, you're at risk of creating something that doesn't belong on the land. You need to immerse yourself on the land, within the environment that the land belongs to and design um, in spirit with it. And um, they're the best outcomes. So the land um, leads us, actually. Yeah. To everyone in the audience, we're probably about 10 minutes to Q&A. So if you have any uh, questions that you wanted to ask our panellists generally or um, specifically, make sure you pop it in the Q&A channel, um, not the chat. Um, Brent, there's an obviously obvious need for durability in high volume public spaces compared to residential, but does the performance requirements change from house to house? For example, residential pro uh, projects in which the occupants spend a lot of time at home, how does that differ to someone else and does it differ? Yeah, absolutely. Um, durability outcomes are, are, you know, are, are different from one, one project to the next. Uh, to talk about residential, uh, everyone's got a, um, a certain lifestyle, um, everyone's got a certain family unit, and uh, you know, it could be a, a, a couple um, you know, that, that live at home, they don't wear the shoes around the house, enjoying, you know, the, 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 if I could say, the timber floor. Um, in, a, in, a, in as a natural uh, aspect as possible to a busy, busy family with young kids, two dogs, um, you know, soccer boots coming in out of the pool, you know, beach house dragons and standing. So absolutely, there is a, um, there is, a, a, you know, durability is important because you know everyone's mentality um, is in a right mentality is that you know my home's my castle, so I want something that's going to last. Um, and you know, from, from the company that I'm coming from, from Hadwoods' perspective, is that we're always pushing the boundaries is to try and you know, make a timber floor more durable than it was last year in terms of you know, the way it's manufactured, different kinds of coating systems, ability to, to repair or refurbish it. So yeah, durability is a, is a huge concern for, for clients. Um, and it, obviously, it, it relates to other materials as well, whether it be ceramics or stone or 
or you know even a painted wall so it's um yeah it, it, a house has got to be livable but it's also got to be practical and trying to um you know find that even balance and manage uh you know a client's expectations is is, is incredibly important i'd like to find materials that hey sorry michelle after you Oh, I just like to add to that point about durability. That increasingly, as we become aware that we aren't a, a world of limitless resource, we do need to be designing our environments to last, and materials need to be robust enough that they don't need to be replaced. And I think this is important for us to realise that the the resources we use in architecture and building are finite and are precious, and we should be designing around this. Like you were saying, uh, with I guess people bringing their Instagram inspiration to you all the time, and Rob was saying people were always wanting the the new the new look. Um, but I think that there is a, going to be greater appreciation for materials that age well and age gracefully and look better um, over a period of time, um, rather than sort of having to be replaced every every five or ten years. Agreed. Mm. Can I? Um, we're focusing on residential buildings today. The, the only truly sustainable residential buildings are actually apartment buildings. Individual houses are quite extravagant. So the only way we believe you can um, find the balance with individual residences is to design something that is um, is going to last if and and serves the purpose. And if it serves a purpose, then it'll be valued. And, and if it's an environment that they love to live in, it'll be loved. And if it's loved and valued, it'll be nurtured. And so then it, finally, the final ingredient is, if it's built of durable materials, it'll last. And if you can get those ingredients into an individual house, then that's the best outcome in terms of sustainability. But the truth is, because this every time we present for an award, the first question is, how is this building sustainable? And to be honest, when it's an individual house, we really struggle to answer that question any other way to admit that they're not sustainable, that we probably should all be living in, in apartment buildings where there's a collective, there's a harnessing of energy and shared energy and, and so on and shared resources and, and so on. So it's interesting that the, there was a lot of um, opinion pieces over the last couple of months um, from people forecasting about how the pandemic might influence the way people live or their accommodation choices in the future. And there was a lot of people saying that we'd sort of have this renaissance of the mid 20th century where people would be flocking um, outwards to suburban lifestyles to sort of build a fortress and um, have everything they needed contained within a house and a backyard and, and um, a, a fence. But you're absolutely right, Rob. It's, it's um, more, more important than ever. I think that we're densifying and um, creating things that um, leverage the resources. Yeah. Just a, a final note to that um, in terms of sustainability, uh, you know, I, I totally appreciate um, every every material um, has serves its purpose. Um, however, you know, you can grow a house, uh, you can grow a you can grow a timber floor. I think um, recent studies at Europe um, through its sustainable forestry practices that has been enforced in about the last um, half a century, they now have enough forest area that is increasing that can build a timber house uh, or grows enough material to build a timber house. Uh, every every minute, so you know there is a there is a um, a balance to be drawn. I appreciate that, um, but absolutely, that, you know, I'd say the next step is uh, regenerative design, where the actual structure or the or the development or the building, you know, has a more than just a a, a net um, you know net zero impact on the environment. It also has a positive, like a, an increase. So that's uh, something that we'll be exploring further as well. Before we jump to Q&A, Michelle, did you want to say anything on that or are we good to? No. All right, we've got um, some sent in. This one's for Rob, Shannon or others, so open it up to everyone. Aesthetically pleasing designs need to also be practical to ensure houses are built to a quality standard. 
What steps do you take throughout the design and realization of a project to make sure the design is not at the expense of quality? Are there steps along the way to pick up on any issues? Well, what do you do or expect to be done in an instance where a design element of the project has compromised quality? Well, quality, quality is the ultimate measure. There's time, cost, and mm. quality. And it's the quality of the experience of creating the um, building yeah. and this quality of the experience living within the building. And, um, and that's influenced by the performance of the materials we use and the quality of the design we create and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I lost that question because it was quite a long question. So I'm not... I think the, the, last quote, the last sentence kind of sums it up. What would you do or expect to be done in an instance where design element of the project has compromised the quality? So when maybe a client is more interested in how something looks than the, you know, the quality of it or the performance of it. I think you can have both if you just focus on it and you're experienced. Mm -hmm. You can have both. So you should have both. I think the process of designing a house is, is just that. It's a process. So, you, you know, when we do a house design, you know, it's a six-month process task of starting with a concept and then looking at it in at one to five scale detail and, and during that long time process there is testing and costing and analysis done of you know various elements of the house and and Rob's right it's it comes down to cost is, is something which is a great driver in what we end up being able to produce in the building industry so a lot, a lot of testing and, and discussion needs to be around that. I think that the pursuit of that um, ever new kind of aesthetic probably goes against um, QA um, and, and the outcome that I think um, all of the designers as part of this have um, particular design aesthetics and um, that's not only because it's, it's a sense of, of design and continuity of style, but it's also because um, many details and many materials have proved themselves to be um, quality and durable um, over their, their life um, and over many years. So we, we continue to use them again and again. Um, most Millie apartments have, have uh, used the one um, style of bathroom basin because um, not because we're, we're particular, we have a commercial arrangement, but because we know that it's um, quality and, and we know the ins and outs of it. So once it's, it's deemed to be um, good quality and um, less likely to, to cause issues, we, we continue with it. Brent, how would you navigate a conversation with someone who was maybe interested in one product um, but another one was more suited to what their needs were? I mean, I suppose the, the first thing you do is find the reason that's driving them towards that. Yeah that product in the first place. So understand their needs rather than try and give them something you think they should need. There might be a valid reason why they're selecting or you know, preferring something else. Um, it could be misguided. It could be well-informed. So I suppose the, the point is, um, yeah, put yourself in their shoes, find out what it is. And you, you can then, as uh, Michelle says, make it a process, find out um, where, where the next logical step will take them, obviously, is there a trade-off between quality versus cost, as Rob says, so. Okay, next question. Is it better to maintain and upgrade a 1930s Art Deco block in a Blue Ribbon estate, sorry, Blue Ribbon Eastern Beaches City, Sydney position alongside others of the same, or sell to a developer and rebuild because it's almost 100 years old now? That's a density question. If you can double the density, um, provided the building's not of architectural merit and should be retained, it probably should be replaced. Anyone else? Need, I, would agree, I would agree with that. Yeah, you need to support our... We need to use our existing infrastructure, public transport, sewer, water, electrical, and so on. So provided it's not a conservation building and the architectural merits and should be retained because it makes a true contribution to the city. Um, if the density can be substantially increased, it should be replaced. Michelle? 
Um, yeah, I probably would be on the other side of the pendulum a little bit more, being a lover of old things and living in an old house myself. Um, and because I think there's more than just the program and the economics to our environment, I think there's also the richer, the, th the, the reasons we travel to Italy to see that sort of like time sort of etched into space. I think there's some merit in understanding there are cultural perspectives on the built environment that are worth preserving as well. And um, certainly I think at the moment I'm working on a project in um, Bellevue Hill where it's quite an awful house, but we're reusing the whole core of the house and inserting new things in it, but we're reusing quite a lot of it. So uh, I think, you know, there is that idea of there's more than just program and, and practicality, that, that you know, culture and history are important to us as, as people and in our environment. Hmm. And we've got another question. If working from home is here to stay, how will this affect the design of apartment living with home office functionality? Um, I think that there's always... Um, been the the idea of needing um, space to have it, it came through that people used to have a, a study space that was suitable for a desktop computer and then all of a sudden that that function sort of evaporated with less people having desktop computers and more people having laptop computers um, not wanting to necessarily work from from that study nook that was um, in vogue for, for so long, but I think now um, the the space that people require um, is changing again. And it was like we were talking about before, adaptable rooms, um, not just treating a, a bedroom in an apartment is is a huge proportion of, of the space. Um, and all spaces, especially bedrooms now need to work harder than ever to form um, lots and lots of different functions. And so the way that they open up to the outdoors, the way they open up to, to other spaces within the apartment um, certainly become far more important um, for many things, including using it to work from home. Can, can I add to that? Because there's technology has changed how we work and communicate with the world. So, within our home, due to Wi-Fi and mobile phones and laptop computers, we can actually work from the couch if we want to, and we do. So um, I noticed that uh, when I ask people if they want a conventional study environment, often they don't. They, the, they choose to work from the dining table, uh, surrounded by their family. Um, I think that's true when there are brief periods of work, but I think, um, and I have heard that there are some employees that are spending vast amount of time crouched over a laptop top on a couch and now got back problems when they're doing it for longer periods of time, such as we've experienced in recent days. Um, so I think that we do need to acknowledge, although that flexibility is possible, I think when it's long periods of time, that's just, we need to actually provide more comfort to people in terms of ergonomic environment yeah I agree, I agree with that we've we've, um, we've seen a, a, an evolution of office design um, you know taking elements from the home to make the office seem more home friendly or more homely natural elements um, plants uh, you know different kinds of um, of, of lighting uh, you know that kind of um, environment to make it you know feel a little bit less sterile and a bit little bit less austere but yet now we've got the office at home so how do we make how you might say can we bring the, the ergonomics and the and, and that aspect of it to, to, to the house and that's something to consider as well. I think that's pretty much all we have time for. Thank you to our panellists, Shannon Peach, Michelle Zaki, Rob Mills, Brad Callow for your time. Thank you for our audience for your attention and your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, uh, but hopefully you know, they were sort of answered in other questions. Uh, join us every fortnight on Wednesdays at 12.30. We'll be doing this um, for five more. So there's plenty more um, opportunities to, to learn some things out of this. So thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.